The Battle of Tipimura uh, was the first of the uh, military victories of the Marcus of Montrose in the remarkable year, 1644-1645, um, which were fought right across Scotland. And uh, so really, Tipimura, the Battle of Tipimura, is, uh, is the battle that got uh, Paul and myself uh, started on this you know, whole project, or publishing project, really. Um, so discovering that one of the most significant years of the 17th century in Scotland began with an event just outside the town in which we lived. It made us hungry for more knowledge of both that battle and others which we were perhaps unaware of. After hundreds of hours of research, writing, photography, drawing, discussion, battlefield visits and dozens of pints of very good ale, uh, this desire for military history, for the military history of Perth and its environments has led to battleground questions. Now, what I'm going to do now is just take you to chapter <coughs> three in the book, which uh, is the the period of the what's known as the English Civil War, but actually is the War of the Three King Kingdoms. So if I may explain this, it's that because it was fought across Scotland, Ireland, and England, and the part played by Scotland in that uh, war, that civil war, was not inconsiderable. And so uh, it, we, here in Persia, we are tied up with events which are actually important in terms of the nation at the time, but also go to the heart of our constitution today. And many of the issues which are still constitutionally live uh, were very much uh, uh, part of, of Scotland at that time. And I think that's uh, something that uh, the lessons of history always teach us. Anyway, the English Civil War began in 1642 and was in the main a struggle for domination of the political, economic and religious life of that country. Scotland, although lagging behind England economically and politically, had thrown off the shackles of the established church and aristocracy by 1642. The attempt by Charles I to control the Church of Scotland and reappropriate uh, church land met with revolt in his northern kingdom. In February of 1638, the writing of the National Covenant set the stage for a major conflict between Scottish and English realms. This proceeded in earnest in January 1644, when the army of the Solemn League and Covenant invaded England with 18,000 infantry, 3,000 horse, and 500 to 600 dragoons. A second invasion was undertaken in June 1644, this time with only 6,800 to 8,000 troops. After the defeat of the Royalists and the execution of Charles I, 30th of January 1649, the first age of the Civil War ended. The period 1644 to 1746 saw Persia at the heart of a nation uh, at the heart of a nation in turmoil over its political future. The period begins in the aftermath of the Bishops' War, 1639-40. It's deeply affected by the English Civil War, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, and a series of risings for the Stuart cause, and ends with the defeat uh, at Culloden in 1746. Events often in Persia soil were at the hub of the upheav upheavals that haunted Scotland at the time and were significant in terms of developing the United Kingdom and the modern British state. Anyway, the Battle of Tipamira. The 1st of September 1644 is a highly significant battle in a key period of Scottish history as it represents the beginning of the campaign waged by James Graham, first Marcus of Montrose, in support of Charles I against the Covenanter controllers of Scotland led by Archibald Campbell, the first Marcus of Argyll. Close links to Persia permeate this campaign because the Marcus of Matrose had, established, had an established power base in the Graham lands between Octorada and Matrose in Angus. Actually, his lands extended right across to Mugdok over on the, 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 the north of Glasgow. Following the defeat suffered by Charles I by the English parliamentary army at Marston Moor, in which the Scots Covenant army played a decisive role, Montrose sought to ease the pressure on the King's forces in England by rallying royalist support in Scotland, primarily to draw Scots troops back from England and Ireland. Randall MacDonald, the Marquis of Antrim, promising 10,000 Irish troops for a campaign against the Covenanters in Scotland, provided between 2,000 and 2,500, landing initially on, uh, Ardnam, on the Ardnamurchan Peninsula um, on the 8th of July 1644, under the leadership of Alastair McCullough. The intention of joining up with royalist forces of uh, Marcus of Huntley was thwarted by the failure of the Gordon Rising in the northeast. Failure to raise sympathetic but cowed northern clans to the cause and pressure from the advancing Campbell forces under Argyll 
forced the beleaguered Irish troops south into Athol. Meanwhile, Montrose, with only two followers, had moved north across the border with the King's Warrant as Lieutenant Governor of Scotland. Having arrived in Perthshire in late August, and whilst in hiding in Medlin Wood, word arrived of Macola's Irish and Highland Army now encamped at Blair, at Blair Castle, which had been abandoned by the Covenanted forces on the 9th of August. Montrose and Patrick Graham of Inchbracky, known as Black Pate, hurried to Blair to take command of the Royalist Army, arriving in the nick of time to prevent a battle between Macola's army and the gathered Robertsons and Athol men determined to repulse these invaders. And that was the standoff at Blair Castle, 29th August 1644. Montrose was uh, known locally and was recognised. Displaying the royal warrant given him uh, the king's authority, he drew together and formed the nucleus of an army which was to sustain him in military campaign lasting just over a year between 1644 and 1645. That night and the next day, a council of war decided to move on Perth rather than Stirling, where Argyle's forces were gathering. With the royal standard, a scarlet lion, raised behind Blair Castle, Montrose and Macola moved their army by way of the River Garry and the River Tay through the Mingus lands between Pitlochry and Aberfeldy, in the hope of gaining more support from Castle Mingus. Instead, the local clansmen harried the moving columns, and the Minguses refused to support the royalist cause. The Irish troops in return harried the local population and burned standing crops en route to Aberfeldy. The burning of Wheen on the 30th to 31st of August, an attack on uh, Castle Meng Mingers on the 30th to 31st of August ended in failure. From Aberfeldy, the logical approach to Perth was by way of the Smar Glen, and here at uh, Bucket Hill by the River Armand on the 31st of August, uh, a f it was here that a force of 600 men, local levies under John Graham, Lord Kilpont, and Sir John Drummond, were charged with guarding the route to Perth. Kilpont, kin of, of Montrose, outnumbered by the approaching force, resolved to join the Royalist cause, and then we are presented with the standoff at Buckety Hill. It is not clear whether Kilpont and Montrose planned this move all the, uh, the time and all the way along. The defection of Stuart of Ardvorich after soon after the Battle of Tippermuir suggests that not all of Kilpont's men were convinced in declaring for the king. Continuing southwest towards Crete, Montrose camped overnight at the Moor of Fowls on the eve of the battle. Okay, so that gives you a bit of the uh, uh, the, the background to it. Um, and what we're now faced with is that uh, in Perth, Lord Elko is gathering uh, an army of local levies. Now you, you must remember that the main Scots army is down in England, and as a consequence, um, Scotland has only militia troops, they're, they're not the highest of quality troops, but they are gathering. So each community is providing um, men to now stand against this threat from Montrose, just as Argyle is raising his army over at Stirling. And Montrose's whole tactic is to avoid the joining of both Argyle and um, Elko's armies, because then he, the odds would really be against him. So I'm going to give you uh, the, the account of the Battle of Tippermuir. Uh, 1st September 1644. We have a royalist army of Charles I, uh, including uh, some of the personalities, uh, Patrick Graham, Ridge Brackey, uh, Montrose himself, there are Roberts and Stuarts, Camerons and Murrays, uh, there's uh, Langton's regiment of Irish, there's uh, Macdonald's regiment of Irish, there's Colonel Manus O'Kane's regiment of Irish. Uh, these are seasoned troops who fought many years in, in Ulster. And then of course we, we have uh, Montrose himself and then some lowlanders from Perthshire and Menteith, the Montrose lands. And of course there are McDonald's of Kefoch who uh, come along as well. And they, these are irregular Highland troops. So essentially Montrose has got uh, what looks like a Highland army. Uh, the Covenanters, uh, of which uh, compared to Montrose's 3,100, uh, certainly there's some estimates put five or 7,000, but realistically they were matched. There was roughly the two armies were roughly matched around about the 3,000 mark. But there we see the early Tullibarden, we saw Lord Elko, uh, Dundee and Four Fisher levies, uh, the Perth trained bands, uh, so that's the militia from Perth, including the, the Glovers Incorporated, uh, they, they send uh, their people out. We see then uh, Sir James Ro uh, Scott of Rossi, Rossi down in the cast, and we see Clack Manager of Fife Cavalry, we see Lord Elko's regiment uh, from Clack Manager and Fife, as well as uh, nine pieces of artillery. 
Anyway, the battle story. The two armies were roughly the same size, but Elko's command had a distinct advantage of 300 cavalry on each wing. This gave the commandos protecting Perth a lo longer line and threatened the royalist flanks. Montrose therefore extended his line, lining up uh, his, his flank regiments. Kilpont on the right and the Athelman under their own command on the left, three deep instead of the normal six deep. McCola's three regiments formed the centre of the royalist formation and may well have been six deep as was the, the, the fashion of fighting those days. Fighting those days was pretty standard. That's the way these civil war battles were fought. Uh, using pikemen and uh, musketeers. The Covenant Centre was commanded by James Murray, the second Earl of Tullibardin, and made up of the Tayside levies, while Lord Elko, as overall commander, controlled the right wing cavalry facing Lord Kilpont. Sir James Scott Rossi, an experienced professional officer, led the left wing cavalry formation. Elko had as many as nine artillery pieces facing the enemy. The formality of the battle involved an approach by David Drummond, the Master of Manatee, to Elko's lines under the flag of truce. Montrose revealed his royal authority as Lieutenant Governor of Scotland to try and persuade the Covenanters to submit to the King. He also suggested a delay so as not to fight on the Sabbath. The ministers attached to, in some numbers to Elko's armies replied, what better day to do the Lord's work. <laughs> the Covenanter army was driven by religious zeal and served under the slogan, Jesus and no quarter. The seizing of Montrose's envoy and his man handling off to Perth to await execution after the battle inflamed the situation. The battle began with Tullibardin sending out a forlorn hope of musketeers and horse from his centre, led by Colonel James Drummond. This was a standard tactic at the time, involving a small group moving towards their enemy within 100 feet or more, and across, it, across its front firing pistols at, as they went in the hope of disrupting their formation and created, creating an opportunity to exploit. The experienced Irish held their line, and the forlorn hope was driven back to their own lines, creating confusion in the centre as they did so. This prompted decisive action from Montrose, whose troops, short of ammunition, actually had one shot each, according to some, uh, fired a single volley at about 30, uh, 20 to 30 paces, and charged through their own smoke, with sword, targe and dirk, uh, all in hand, with their, their muskets clubbed as well. This so unnerved the raw, inexperienced government soldiers that they immediately broke and the battle became a rout. Neither Elko nor Kilpont on their side of the battlefield seemed to have engaged. Montrose made a dash for the high ground on his right, uh, just gaining its advantage ahead of Scott of Ross's cavalry. Firing a single volley at them, they failed to drive them back, but attacked the horsemen and their mounts by charging down the slope of them, even throwing stones to add to the ferocity of their attack. The fierce fight developed, but Rossi's men proved no match for Montrose's Highlanders and were driven back. Elko's whole, whole line had now crumbled and was fleeing for safety to, uh, to, to Perth in confusion, with riders driving through the disorganised infantry, who were abandoning their weapons. Some of the townsfolk of Perth who had come out to watch the battle were caught up in the retreat. The numbers of Covenanter casualties vary according uh, to source, but as many as 1,000 dead were left on the battlefield and on the line of retreat that ran uh, towards Broxden and Needless Road, seeking either the safety of Petheathless Castle or the walls of Perth. Accounts suggest that more than 300 Covenanters lie in an unmarked grave in Timbermore Churchyard. Estimates of prisoner numbers vary wildly. Mostly, most likely were around 300 to 400 marked. During the Royalist occupation of Perth, the Covenanter prisoners were held in St John's Kirk. The Royalist casualty level was very low, with just a few dozen killed. Do you want me to continue a little bit in the morning? Well, why, why are there so short of ammunition? That seems extraordinary. Uh, yes, yeah, so the reason is that uh, Macola landed in Ardnamurchan. He, he was, came across on ships uh, from Northern Ireland, from Antrim. And while they landed in Ardnamurchan, the ships are actually attacked by the Scots Navy, uh, or by, by the, the, the English Navy, as, uh, no doubt, as well. And uh, they, they lost a lot of their supply. So then they made a progress down through the highlands, trying to gain that sort of highland spot, which you, know, you saw later when uh, the, the, the Jacobites were doing the same sort of thing, but failed to really get that support. In particular, they didn't get the support of the Marquis of Huntley, who, because of the previous uh, encounter he'd had with Montrose in the Bishop's War, 
when uh, Montrose had guaranteed him uh, his safety, um, the Covenanters had actually thrown him in jail. And so there was a bitter disagreement between the two main royalist factions, the, the Marx and Huntley, the Gordons, and uh, uh, Montrose. And that continued right throughout Montrose's campaign in the next year, that he could never get the Gordons really on size. Part of the clan joined with him and part didn't, but I think Montrose's campaign in 1644 and 1645, which was very successful uh, in, in taking the, the whole of Scotland by 1645 uh, after the Battle of Kilside, it would have been much more successful had he had the Gordon cavalry. He was always short of uh, cavalry. And of course, living on, off the land as they, they were on their progress from Ardna Merkin down into the highlands where they met with a lot of hostility, as you saw at the start at uh, Athol, uh, they, they really did have a supply problem. And this, of course, was Montrose's motivation in taking Perth, was because Perth was a, uh, a staging post for the, this army, and therefore there was a lot of supply. And indeed, the army was clothed uh, at the expense of Perth, and uh, money and munitions and weapons were taken uh, at, at Perth. After the Battle of Tibermore, all the uh, Covenanter dead were found to be naked, the next day uh, because they'd been stripped and there's a good reason that is that again the need for supply I mean these were well equipped relatively well equipped troops uh, fighting a, an army who were probably by this time quite ragged and so they were stripped of all their equipment and uh, munitions and, and weapons so the, the battle including the, the nine or so cannon the, the, the battle is actually quite significant because it did set up then the campaign not only in, in routing a, a, a Important government force, but also in providing the supply that the Marx and Troes needed. He, he, he fought uh, battles then uh, at, in Aberdeen, uh, notorious for the sacking of Aberdeen. He then went on to fight at um, uh, Aldern and Inverlochy and uh, Kilsyth, uh, before finally being defeated at uh, Selkirk in at the Battle of Philip Hawk in 16, uh, summer of 1645. Uh, uh, five, five. So it, it was a very important campaign, but it, its start was here, its, uh, its impetus was here in Perth.